Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, I'm going to talk all about aviation and uh, climate change. Of course, record numbers of people are flying now. Four billion passengers per year, and that number is expected to double in the next 20 years. On June 29th, 2019, that day was the bu busiest day in terms of the number of planes that flew. There were 202,157 planes flew that day. That's about double the quietest day in the past uh, 12 months. So the quietest day in the past 12 months was Christmas Day in 2018. On Christmas Day in 2018, 101,511 planes were in the air that day. The peak number of planes in the air on the busiest day, June 29, 2019, was over 19,000 flights were concurrently in the air over the globe, around the globe. Normally, the peaks in July and August are about 16,000 or so. So 19,000 represented a large increase over the norm. The top 10 days for flying are typically within the window of December 20th to mid-January of any year. Although I did say that Christmas Day was the quietest day. Four billion passengers fly every year. There's 7.6 billion people on the planet right now. Right, of course, there's multiple, you know, people or passengers, you know, if they're businessmen and doing business travel and so on, then, uh, you know, they'll have multiple flights in a year. And like I said, that 4 billion passengers that fly every year, that's expected to double over the next two decades by 2040 or so and be to about 8 billion people, which would surpass the population of the planet right now that's sitting at 7.6 billion. The Aviation Safety Network said that since 1948, only 85 aircraft have disappeared without a trace. The last uh, such case was Malaysian Flight 370 in 2014 um, that vanished without a trace over the ocean. The cheapest plane tickets are typically found 70 days before a flight and there's many many websites where people can buy very very cheap airfares. So this is contributing of course to more and more people flying. If you look on the uh, global map, Flight Radar 24 shows all of the uh, flights you know, sort of real time over the day. And you can see the um, flows of the traffic over to Europe and between Europe and Asia and etc. cetera. Um, the fewest number of flights uh, are in, uh, right now are covering over West China typically, also over large periods of, large uh, sections of Russia, there's very few flights. Northern Scandinavia fits into that category and also uh, Central Africa and also uh, Western Australia. Um, on June 29th, there was only one crazy or brave or foolhardy, call him what you want, pilot who flew over Libya because of, his, because of the uh, danger uh, there. So, the problem with international flights is the carbon emissions from international flights does not get counted within any one country's carbon emissions. It escapes the whole system. Uh, domestic flights, so all of the flights from U.S. destinations to U.S. destinations, for example, all those domestic flights are calculated with the emissions in the total carbon budgets but not in the case of international flights. One of the, you know, you can't avoid flying across the ocean, say, to get to Europe from North America. You know, by boat, it would take an awful long time, but you can avoid 
most or many domestic flights. These could all be replaced by high-speed bullet trains, for example, by maglevs, magnetically levitated trains, very low friction to the rails. They're almost like floating above the rails. And those trains can go 300 kilometers an hour, 400 kilometers an hour. They're extremely safe. They have automatic shutdown systems. Uh, you know, if, there, if there's earthquakes or something, like in Japan system, um, the emissions, like I said, you know, we're really, we're not counting emissions from international flights. And international flights, the number of people going on international flights, the number of international flights that there are, are increasing gangbusters. You know, aviation as an industry is not that large, but it's got a disproportionate effect on emissions and on climate change. Roughly four to nine percent of the total climate change impact of human activity is from uh, the airline industry. It's from flights. Since uh, the, the uh, not only that but the climate change impacts of aircraft flying is roughly two to four times higher than that from the CO2 emissions alone. And this is due to the nitrous oxides, the water vapor, aerosols, other things like that that are emitted. Also the contrails. Um, the contrails, the, the, the output of jet engines is of course extremely hot, got lots of CO2 and water vapor in. The water vapor condenses and forms droplets or ice uh, crystals in the high atmosphere causing the contrails and these contrails get blown by the wind over time and can spread as wide as two miles and uh, they do two things during the daytime they block some of the sunlight so that has a slight cooling effect on the planet but at night but they also well 24 7 they um, basically the um, the contrails they absorb the long wave radiation that's emitted from the ground so they trap heat so they uh, have a cause an increased uh, temperature so this is why you know flights during the night there's no uh, light being blocked the sun's down below the horizon so the only effect of the contrails at night is the heating effect so that heating effect is much larger than it would be otherwise um, if the plane was flying during the day. Okay, that's one thing to remember. Since 1990, the CO2 emissions from the airline industry from aircraft has, is up 83%. You know, it really turns out that cheap, so-called, so quote, cheap fares are not cheap at all when you take into account the climate factor. There's lots of different people that have sworn off flying. Um, I try to fly as little as possible, only if I absolutely have to. And there's lots of climate scientists who have completely sworn off flying. And uh, you, you might be aware of Greta Thunberg, the, uh, the girl who started, uh, the, the woman, young woman who started uh, Climate Strike for Fridays. Um, she's not flying anywhere. She takes a train and boats different places. Um, she's sworn off, off uh, flying. And I don't know if you remember, but the uh, contrails, the contrail effect um, is a good illustration of what we call global dimming. And basically, what global dimming is, basically, the, um, during, after 9-11, planes did not fly over North America for several days. So there were not contrails put into the air. So those contrails, um, so what happened is, the temperatures were noticeably different. What really changed is the diurnal or daily temperature variation. 
So the daily low and the daily high, the difference between those two numbers increased with no contrails. And the reason why this was happening is that during night, there was no contrails or very few contrails because commercial airplanes were all grounded. So as a result, there was a lot more of the long wave radiation or heat emitted by the ground at night could escape into space. So daily temperature, daily lows at night were uh, lower than they were in, in, in the normal case. And the daily highs, uh, there were no contrails to block any of the light during the day. So the daily highs were higher. Okay, so the difference, the highs minus the lows had a significantly um, larger range, I believe of a few degrees Celsius during those days when aircraft were grounded. So this really shows the effect of the contrails. It shows the effect of, of uh, you know, those types of clouds that were created and uh, demonstrated, you know, how, you know, another way of how humans are modifying the, the, plant, the uh, climate. Now, in case you're wondering, in case you may have noticed that I'm near an airport, um, if you're observant, and uh, basically I'm at, on the uh, landing path at Toronto's Pearson Airport, the Toronto International Airport. And uh, I basically, I'm at the fence leading to the runway and uh, you can see these uh, massive aircraft uh, flying over me. And uh, they're pretty well lined up. I think we've got a full house. Um, so they're queuing up and uh, they're passing over my head roughly every 90 seconds. So you could do that test as you're watching this video to uh, see if that frequency holds. It's, it's pretty good for the most part. Sometimes there's gaps. It never seems to be shorter than 90 seconds. Um, but uh, sometimes they're a bit longer than 90 seconds. And the reason is that the, the, these massive machines moving through the air are causing lots of wake turbulence. So the turbulence, you know, it's displacing air, pushing it out of the way. And then uh, the air is very whirly and twirling and turbulent behind the aircraft for several miles, for many, many miles or kilometers. So to let these eddies die down, there's uh, aviation rules that restrict the, the, uh, num the, you know, restrict the next plane coming along. And they've determined, I guess, that 90 seconds is enough for all the eddies and whirls to, to dissipate from these aircraft um, to allow the next uh, plane to come along. So, um, so as you know, you know, when we count carbon emissions, and when countries meet at places like Paris to set uh, emissions caps and things, we need to count all the emissions. So there's a problem with a number of different industries, and I've mentioned international flights is one of them. But also the marine industry um, has very, very high emissions. And you can actually see um, from satellite images the, uh, the, the um, hot exhaust coming out of the smokestack of ships, depending on what type of fuels they're using, heavy bunker C or whatever it is they use. There's some sulfur in it. You can get uh, aerosols and clouds generated that track the paths of these ships along the ocean. And you can see this clearly from satellite uh, data. So one of the problems I think uh, with the maritime shipping industry is I don't think a lot of those emissions are properly uh, calculated in the carbon budget either. And another big enormous factor that, um, that uh, you know, another call it an industry or, or uh, you know, human endeavor or whatever is, is militaries of many, many countries. They, they're very, very heavy fossil fuel users and a lot of their emissions are not counted in, um, in the country's uh, carbon budget. So this obviously has to change. This is completely unacceptable and uh, I should probably do some separate uh, videos on this. I was hoping to catch another plane before my video ends, but 